to all our partners. Recording in progress. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you can just use um, the chat. Now, as most of you probably know, we are currently in the last stretch of the negotiations on the EU's new rulebook that would impose more responsibilities and obligations on platforms, in particular on very large online platforms. We expect there to be a deal on the uh, Digital Markets Act later today, and within the next uh, couple of months, uh, e probably even as, as, as soon as next month, we are expecting a deal on the Digital Services Act as well. And there are many highly interesting aspects related to the DSA, of course, but today's event focuses on how the DSA can empower the users of those platforms. Because in the end of the day, one of the aims of the Digital Services Act is indeed to set out uniform rules for a and I quote here from the document, a safe, predictable, and trusted online environment where fundamental rights, as they are enshrined in the EU's Fundamental Rights Charter, are effectively protected. And as our speakers will, will definitely point out later, for many users, platforms haven't necessarily been a very safe and, and accommodating environment. Now, users have always been an extremely important part of, of policing platforms, since platforms are obliged to act on notices or flags from users when those users see illegal content on these platforms. And now Article 7, Article 17 of the proposed Digital Services Act fine tunes actually how platforms should react to user notifications or complaints from users. So it basically forces platforms to give users access to an effective internal complaint handling system. And now one important aspect that was, I think, unintentionally forgotten in the proposal is that users user should not only be able to complain when content is removed or when their accounts are, in their views, wrongfully suspended, but equally important is the ability of users to complain when platforms have left content up or wrongfully decided not to remove uh, content that is illegal or violates their terms and, and conditions. Now, our first speaker is Francis Hogan. Uh, by now probably the most well-known advocate for accountability and transparency in, in social media. And so Francis, it's really, it's really great to, uh, to have you here. Um, you are a data scientist and an algorithmic product manager, and obviously you have been working at, um, at Facebook before. Um, as I said earlier, um, our discussion today focuses on whether or not the DSA must also allow for complaints to be launched by individuals or entities against decisions to refrain actually from taking actions on allegedly illegal content or content that is incompatible with um, their terms and conditions. Now, considering your um, insider experiences, could you run us a bit through what is being done with user notifications, for instance, at Facebook? What, what role do user notifications play in, for instance, Facebook's uh, content moderation efforts and, and how and when are complaints actually being um, escalated? The floor is yours. Okay, good. Hi. Um, I have a quick, a quick bit of context for folks. Um, thank you for inviting me today to this very important discussion. I want to start by saying that I didn't set out to be a whistleblower, but I found myself confronting a horrible truth inside of Facebook. I knew I had access to information that the public needed, information that could potentially save lives. That's why I disclosed the documents that showed the world what Facebook knew, it, that knew the consequences of the choices that were driving harm, and yet still failed to act. At the heart of my disclosures is a hope that we can recognize and claim our agency to challenge the power of these platforms and get social media that brings out the best in us. Facebook is very good at giving us false choices and telling us how changing their products or policies is so hard or difficult or, or even impossible. But remember that the choice they always face is a simple one, whether to protect our safety or protect their profits. And for as long as they are allowed to get away with it, they will always choose profit. Until the incentives change, Facebook will not change. I'm here to remind us all, and particularly policymakers who are crafting the Digital Services Act, that we have a golden opportunity to put people's safety back in people's hands by enabling a vital provision around redress. 
My understanding is that right now, the lawmakers working on the DSA text are debating whether to enable user redress, whether platforms, when, uh, what, where platforms fail to take any action on content flagged by users. So far, the proposal only clearly enables redress if platforms actually do something, such as a takedown or a slowdown of content. In other words, you can challenge platform action, but you cannot challenge platform inaction. If there's one message that should be loud and clear from my disclosures, it should be that platform inaction is the problem. And the further you move away from English speaking, the English speaking world, the worse this problem becomes. Remember, 87% of Facebook's operational budget for tackling misinformation was spent in the US alone, or excuse me, for English alone. In places like Myanmar, India, this has lethal consequences. When Rohingya Muslims who have gone through a genocide would flag hate speech and disinformation against them, they would just get automated replies saying the post doesn't violate the platform's community standards. Because Facebook decided they didn't want to pay for moderators who spoke Burmese. Just days ago, Global Witness, an NGO, was still able to have approved eight ads with explicit calls to kill the Rohingya. And they were, they were approved to be distributed. Um, a Navaz study on hate speech in India found that Facebook only took down 27% of the posts and comments that were flagged. These called for the explicit killing and mass, mass, mass massacre of Muslims and Avaz received automated messages saying the posts don't, don't violate the platform's community standards. An investigation by Lycra and HateAid on content moderation ahead of the approaching French presidential election found that Facebook let 70% of far-right hate speech, mainly racism and anti-Semitism and hate against migrants stay on the platform. So why does enabling user redress in this context become important and what should it look like? In the EU, platforms are not required to monitor for illegal or harmful content on their platform. That means the system of mitigation of online harms on their platform actually relies heavily on users flagging content to the platforms where it might violate terms or conditions or is illegal, illegal content. Yet even as this is increasingly difficult, it is becoming increasingly difficult as many in civil society have no noticed. We are facing digital colonialism. Facebook is extracting tens of billions of dollars from people who bear all the costs and get zero say in how they're treated or exploited. What we have is a major asymmetry of power between people who use social media and the platforms themselves. Currently, users have no option to challenge inaction or even decisions made. If the DSA, DSA's Article 17 doesn't close this gap, then platforms will only be incentivized to continue doing little to nothing. Users must be able to challenge platforms' actions and inactions. And specifically, users should be able to get a second assessment of, of their reporting and even an out-of-court mechanism that further pressures the platforms for human assessment. Users' ability to flag this content is also a vital source of training data for platforms' AI content moderation. From a platform design perspective, content moderation should be the last line of defense. Platforms should first and foremost make massive changes upstream, such as content neutral design changes that can slow down the spread and reach of illegal or harmful content. Social media platforms should, make, should be made human scale. Facebook has run experiments that shifted back towards what social media was like in 2008, meaning more content from family and friends. And for free, you get less hate, nudity, and violence. The problem here isn't bad people or bad content, it's systems of algorithms that are rigged to prioritize anger and hateful content. Hopefully the DSA's systemic risk assessment mechanisms will address these upstream problems. But from a user's perspective, content moderation is the first line of defense, which is the ability to immediately report harmful or illegal content as soon as they encounter it. Platforms might argue that such a redress mechanism will overburden them, that it'll be gamed and exploited. And there might certainly be instances where that happens, but that can never be an excuse to do nothing about calls to kill. Always remember that if, if they can find money to hire 10,000 new engineers to build video games in the metaverse, they can hire 10,000 people to ensure our safety. Facebook today invests a huge amount in being able to efficiently, efficiently deal with people's reports of hate speech, of violence. They have algorithms that make predictions even before a human looks at it to say, will that human judgment actually lead to content being taken down? 
But this again puts us not in the hands of human beings, it puts us in the hands of algorithms. And when we have the Facebook's own documents have shown, the algorithms are very bad at assessing things like hate speech because hate speech and calls for violence often require lots and lots of context. You know, the difference between something that is neutral or maybe is anti-racism and racist speech is very subtle. And computers are bad at those kinds of subtle distinctions. We need to call for uh, Facebook to not be allowed to have computers get between human reports and human judgment. We need to make sure that they hold, they don't just prioritize for the cheapest path, but for the best path. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francis. I think that was very uh, illuminating and, and interesting to hear uh, as well. I'd like to move immediately to um, our next speaker, to uh, Emma Winberg, who was the who is the widow of James Le Missourier, who was co-founder of the Syrian rescue group uh, The White Helmets and director of the nonprofit May Day Rescue Foundation. Emma, welcome, and it's really great to uh, to have you here. Um, I think you have unfortunately experienced sort of firsthand the impact of disinformation on on social media platforms. Could you maybe walk us through your story and, and talk a little bit more about um, how a balanced user redress mechanism in the Digital Services Act, for instance, could have helped users um, like yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, everyone. And thanks, Francis. It was super interesting. Um, so yes, as you described, so my background is from the Syrian conflict. That's where I'm coming to speak to you today. In 2013, uh, just a bit of history in case you don't know who the White Helmets are, in 2013, um, opposition areas in Syria were being heavily bombarded and there were no emergency services to speak of. So my husband started working with uh, networks of community volunteers who were trying to dig people out of the rubble, organized them, funded them and equipped them to do their jobs better and safely. And that network grew over the course of about six years into around 4,000 volunteers, men and women doing this job. They're known as the White Helmets now. Uh, because of their characteristic white helmets. And one of the things I think that's important to mention here is that, yes, they were primarily involved in emergency response. What that meant from an information and disinformation perspective was that because they were humanitarian, civilian, they didn't fit the regime's narrative, the Syrian regime's narrative, that everybody in an opposition held area was a terrorist. And the fact that they were unarmed contributed to that as well. That was one of the reasons why they were targeted online. The other reason was the fact that they were recording with their helmet cameras, which were primarily intended for training purposes. They were the first on scene and they were documenting war crimes and uh, atrocities. Um, this was something obviously that uh, the regime and later Russia, when Russia entered the war in 2015, wanted to uh, discredit in order to avoid accountability and prevent unity from forming around a collective response in the West. I say this because as we watch the, the events in Ukraine unfolding, I think that there is no more pressing time for this discussion. Um, what we experienced was in 2015, when Russia joined the conflict, was a rat radical uptick in disinformation against us. What went from random actors and people with, let's say, unpleasant opinions suddenly started to look incredibly coordinated. We spotted this trend in probably around early 2016. So that's before the fall of Aleppo. We started reporting this. We started reporting this to the platforms. We started reporting it to our donors, our international donors, saying we think this is a problem, we think it's coordinated, and it's starting to look Russian because it's being amplified on RT and then being lifted at a diplomatic level by Russian diplomats at the UN. We were at the time, this is 2016, this is before everybody knows about US election interference and the IRA, and it's before people have started to wake up to the name, the concept of the language of disinformation, unless you're in the Russia space when everyone understood it and saw it as obvious, but we weren't. We, weren't, we were people working in emergency response in the Middle East. This had never come across our radar. So we were reporting original posts and we were reporting bits of what we started to see was we would call hate speech in our own way or at least incitement to violence. One individual account became synonymous with this and has become almost like the sort of flagship account of disinformation in the Syrian conflict. And that is an individual called Vanessa Bealey. Why she's relevant is that she tweeted on a number of occasions that the White Helmets are legitimate targets. Now that in itself 
again, this speaks to Francis's point about what is hate speech. You have to understand what that means. And in order to understand that that is important, you have to know that Vanessa Bailey has met in person with Bashar al-Assad, that she is pictured on Facebook hanging out with Russian high military command and Christian militias operating in Syria. So when she calls for that, I believe that she is actually part, should be considered part of a military disinformation shaping operation ahead of operations which then target the white helmets to over 260 have been killed and over 700 have been seriously injured in the line of duty as a result of double tap strikes and direct targeting. I mean, to give you an idea, four centers were destroyed in the morning of uh, the attack against Aleppo. So if we look at this, this is not, this is coordinated behavior. Yet the people who are on the receiving end of this are not coordinated because we're not part of a disinf disinformation campaign. So all we can do is make these complaints. Now, we met with exactly, it took, I think, three years before we got a response. We started making complaints in 2015. We finally, when the white helmets have been covered, for example, in The Guardian, there was an enormous story about it, which revealed the nature of the disinformation in December 2017. But it took until around March 2018, after the Skripal poisonings, for us to really gain traction with the platforms. And that resulted in sufficient attention to the case of the state-sponsored disinformation campaign against the White Helmets for us to get a meeting with the platforms where we were able to brief them in detail, briefing their engineers, briefing their policy people. Some action was taken at that point, but still not enough, because terms and conditions are a matter for interpretation. And I can tell you that we have a much better understanding than some kids sitting at the Twitter office in, in San Francisco. It just, it, and it's not to say that uh, the engineers, there's any, it's not their fault, it's just not their job. So this is the importance of moderation and having moderators who speak the language and who have sufficient nuance to understand what means what. So by 2018, when we finally got some form of action taken, and I'd say it was still very, very limited, the information war or the disinformation war had been won. Nobody intervened in Syria. And as a result of that failure to act, we are seeing what we are seeing in the Ukraine conflict. I was in Poland and Slovakia two weeks ago, speaking to civil society activists who were seriously concerned about disinformation on Facebook because Facebook is the most important platform in both those, both those countries. They are already starting to see divisive narratives targeting Ukrainian refugee populations coming into those countries. This is extremely dangerous. This is, this is a war in Europe. This is not a war on the European border. It's already in Europe. A group of Slovakian, very coordinated civil society activists spoke to Facebook about this problem and said, please, can you stop? Please, can you do something about this? Well, they did some analysis of their own and they think they estimated that around 80% of the narratives that were on Facebook and 80% of the content was in fact citing, inciting hatred, violence or pro-Russia narratives. Facebook said, can't be done. We have one moderator and they sit in Warsaw. That is unacceptable. This cannot be the case. And it cannot take three years after the stuff is being pumped in, paid for and pumped in at an industrial level by the adversary who we know is trying to undermine us. And so that is where I find ourselves now. I am more worried than anything about what is about to happen in Europe. And here is an element where the European Union can take decisive action to, to create a change that forces these platforms to take responsibility. Absolutely, the asymmetry. I mean, I look at the only reason I got those meetings was because we were so notorious for this campaign. But how does that work at an individual level? How does that work for other small organizations in civil society? They don't have the budgets, they don't have the access. And yet it needs to happen. So a formalized mechanism, redress mechanism that, that enables us to do this, that enables us to have access to challenge the decisions that are fundamentally lazy and understaffed is 100% essential. That's it from me. Thank you very much, uh, Emma, for the very powerful story and that sort of incredible um, ex experience that you that you had to go through as well. Um, next up, um, we have our next speaker, actually. Um, we have uh, Josephine Bayon, head of legal at German NGO HateAid. 
Um, and Hated has been one of these uh, civil society actors that has been advocating actually for quite a long time that the DSA should um, strengthen users' rights, including sort of the rights uh, to a balanced redress mechanism under Article uh, 17. I think hate hate has also been um, representing the interests of victims of hate speech and online violence who wish for this sort of content to be uh, mit mitigated. So we would be very interested in, in hearing also your perspective, sort of like what is your take on the ongoing uh, DSA negotiations and, and what is at stake here actually for the people that you, uh, that you try to help? Thank you. Yeah. So I'm the head of Legal at Hate Aid, which is a Berlin-based uh, consultation center only for victims of online violence. Um, in the last three years since Hate Aid was founded, we consulted more than 1,900 people and we supported more than 170 with, financially, uh, with financial um, support to pursue their rights against the perpetrators, but also after the platforms. So we know a bit about the struggle of users and we saw some cases. And we also followed the DSA negotiations for more than a year now. And we see that from the very beginning of these negotiations, there was a very, very strong focus on overblocking, which means the unlawful removal of content, which is an important topic. Um, this, is, um, this is undoubtedly true, but still we see in our consultation with the um, almost 2,000 2, people that we consulted, that the reality of the users that are affected from online violence is slightly different because the vast majority of them reaches out to us not because of overblocking by the platforms, but because of the fact that their content was not removed. They tell us again and again that they reported it several times and nothing happened. They don't even receive a reply or it was just a text block. They don't know how to reach out to them and how to uh, get a proper decision. And this is why we think um, that the redress mechanisms can have a very, very crucial role um, in the moderation and of illegal and also harmful content, which, as we already heard here today, um, really relies on the users. And we need to enable the users to insist on their right for proper content moderation and the proper even, even human assessment, I would say. This is something that we can ask from the platforms um, that, uh, yeah, they... they um, that they should, should, should get. And also, yeah, of course, we talk a lot um, to our clients and um, to the users and also the victims of online violence, uh, but we also made a broader survey. And it turns out that these redress mechanisms are exactly what also the users in the European Union, or at least in the three countries that we observed, want. The countries were Germany, France, and Sweden. And I think the numbers that we generated here speak a very, very uh, clear message we saw that 82% of the users that we, um, that we asked agree that users should have access to redress mechanisms, meaning all users should have access, no matter if they're affected from removal of content or from non-removal. And we also saw that there is a huge unsatisfaction among users about how, um, how notices are handled by the platforms, how content moderation is done. So we saw that almost every second uh, person um, that we asked uh, said that um, the notification uh, mechanisms don't serve the purpose. They are unsatisfied with it. And we saw that the main reasons for unsatisfaction are, that, of course, sometimes that the platform uh, does not take action. Um, every second person said this, but also 42% of the people said that um, they did not receive a response which is also really bad and also frustrating for the users if they um, just um, feel ignored by the platforms um, and they somehow made the effort uh, to make a contribution to a safer internet and then they don't even uh, receive a reply. And 36 of the people, they even said that they have no idea what happened to their notice, which is also not very encouraging for the users to keep on reporting and keep on uh, making their contribution to, to a proper content moderation. And I think that these numbers show very clearly that content moderation is not transparent at all to the users. And we see it's also not comprehensible for the users. Um, and also the users feel left alone and they feel helpless. This is something that we hear many, many times in our consultation that they really felt ignored and left alone by the platforms, although they had a serious issue to report here. 
um, this is how, the, how they feel treated uh, by the platforms um, that really do everything to not be contacted by the users uh, too much. They really hide the notification channels, they hide um, the contact details. Um, so users that made it there already took some effort uh, to make a contribution. And I also think that this is fatal. We heard it today um, because the mitigation of harmful and illegal content relies so much on the users. So we should encourage the users and not try to hinder them from um, taking their part. And there's also something that we ask the people because we're also working on the litigation financing, giving users access to justice. This is a really important issue for us. How likely they were to turn to a court if they uh, want to have a solution for some, uh, some problem in content moderation. And it turns out that only 3% of the people we asked said that they turned to a court already and only 13% um, would, would yeah, think about it. So would consider to uh, turn to a court if they had a problem. And this is from our perspective and from our experience as a consultation center and also from the court cases that we've seen exactly what the platforms rely on. They rely on the inactiveness of users. They rely on the fact that nobody will challenge their decisions because it's too much effort, it's too expensive, and nobody uh, will even ask a question about it. And that's, um, that's a cycle that we have to break. And I think we can break it by giving all users access to redress mechanisms because then they have something that they can do to insist on a proper content moderation, to annoy the platforms, to say it like this. Um, to really give them some, some work to do and force them and push them to improve um, content moderation. And the political choice that we have here is quite clear. We should uh, follow the council approach that already saw this problem and adopted it in their mandate and do the only thing um, that makes sense here to give all users access to these uh, redress mechanisms, no matter if they are on the, on the removal side or on the notification side. It's really time to give users some sort of low threshold option to act against the, the content that we see, the, the violent content, the unlawful content, the harmful content, no matter what, because as Francis already pointed out, this is the only option that they, that they have from a reasonable point of view, um, because all the other options uh, would take too much effort and be too expensive and just not reasonable uh, for users of social media platforms. And also the DSA is the chance that we have now. We cannot rely on other chances that we uh, might get in a decade or something because we need it now. We see it in the Ukraine crisis. We saw it in so many other crises. Emma described um, very, um, very well um, what, what it could have served um, in the Syrian war already. Um, and we should really take this opportunity and not miss it. And also this is an appeal to the lawmakers we should listen to the citizens, to the users, to the citizens of the European Union, and not to the platforms that, of course, they have, uh, they have some, some questions about how should we pay for it, how should we get the resources. But I think we all agree, and also this is something that Francis um, points out again and again, they have the money. They can build the resources if they want. And in the end, it's the people that we are doing politics for. So not we are doing this, but the lawmakers are doing it. And I think that's why we should listen to the people here, to the citizens of the EU. Thank you, Josephine. I think that's a very uh, clear and, and forceful message as well to the current negotiators of the, of the Digital Services Act. Um, I just want to remind everyone in our audience that the, uh, there is still the ability to um, enter questions through the Q&A function. And while, while people are thinking about which questions they want to submit to our panel, um, I just wanted to uh, pick up on, on one thing that both you, Josephine, and um, uh, Francis also already mentioned, which is that one argument that we have often heard in this context if, is that if the DSA would indeed um, allow for users to complain on, on platform inaction regarding content that is uh, incompatible with their terms and, and services, uh, platforms would be really overwhelmed by just the sheer volume of complaints that they would be getting. Um, maybe a question to, to Francis first, like, do you think that this is an, a fair assessment? Like, could, should, could or should platforms like Facebook be in a position to, um, to really handle this? And is it sort of an, an, a cost that is, um, uh, that, is, that is okay to make, actually? So there's this interesting question around, um, you know, uh, 
I feel like when we have a lot of conversations about Facebook, we act as if all decisions are made in isolation instead of the idea that decisions are actually made in concert. That, you know, uh, imagine a world where Facebook was forced to deal with the consequences of content distribution. They would likely, you know, attempt to do things like staff up more moderators, but it's also likely they would run some analysis and say, oh, well, you know, we have a whole bunch of options today that are not about content, but would end up reducing the distribution of, of, of the most extreme content on the platform. So it's like hate speech, that's violence, that's nudity. If they show more content to you from your family and friends, you get less of that all around. So I think it's really um, uh, uh, reductive to come in and just say, this is gonna cost a lot of money. It'll cost a lot of money if they don't change anything. But it might also provide that little extra push for them to adopt reforms that they already know about, but which today, when they look at the incentives, they say that's not it's not worth it. It's not worth it to us to make it safer. But if we put more cost on them, maybe it would be worth it to make it safer. So yeah, I don't I don't think it's as simple as just that. So maybe following up on on this as well, like there is a, a question from the audience. Um, uh, directed towards Francis, and the person is asking, like, in your rough estimate, would what factor should investment or spending in, in platform content moderation increase in, in Europe? And what part of that investment mm. should be paid by, by platforms, by governments, and or by, by users? Like, who should bear the costs, basically, of increased content moderation efforts? One of the things that is, I think is really profoundly negligent is we don't have any transparency today into how many moderators are staffed per language in Europe. You know, one of the most frequent questions I was asked when I was in France was how many moderators speak French? And I think the reason why particularly the French asked this question over and over again is because they are, I, I, from, from documents I've seen inside of Facebook, it looks like there is significantly less investment in, in say French than German or in Spanish. Um, because remember, Facebook doesn't invest in safety based on need. They invest in safety on, on avoiding um, collateral damage, you know, blowback from uh, people complaining about their systems. Um, I guarantee you there are people who speak smaller languages in Europe. So uh, my family uh, is Norwegian and Dan on my father's side is Norwegian and Danish. Guarantee you there's very little support for Danish and, and Norwegian. <laughs> um, Europe is very diverse. Remember, even within French, you know, Breton French is different than French in Paris. Um, AI is not smart. It's very bad at dialects. Um, it, there is likely a substantially larger investment in safety that would be needed even to get a, 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 a reasonable degree of, of efficacy around moderation. But until we know for sure how many moderators are currently staffed, we can't know what exactly that magnitude of increase would be. Josephine, is this also an argument that you have been hearing in your sort of advocacy that this might be an, a, a too burdensome um, a requirement or request upon, upon the platforms? And, and what would be your reaction to this? Yes, we heard it a lot. And especially we heard uh, the argument that this will invite users to misuse uh, these uh, complaint channels, uh, to like complain about everything without any reasons, only to to yeah, harass the platforms, but also other users uh, maybe that uh, might be blocked then because of too many notifications. Um, but I can say that I don't really buy this argument, to be honest. Um, so on the one hand, I, I cannot tell you how many resources need to be spent on which platform and how much would it cost. Uh, that's not my expertise. But I think that we can request the platforms to build a safe enough structure for users um, because there is a specific risk to society that they pose because of the service they offer. And so they also have to make sure that these risks are mitigated, the risks to society and democracy, as we've seen in, in, in many occasions. And also at the risk of misuse, um, I, have to, I have to say that I really don't think that people uh, would like to misuse these channels um, only to annoy the platforms. Uh, why should they be incentivized to do it? Uh, nobody has, has time to do it. And if they want to um, do it to harm other people, to make their profiles blocked because of the sheer mass of notifications, then the result that this is possible, that this is a possible strategy to uh, silence people on the internet, it's only because of algorithmic decisions 
of wrongful content moderation decisions that are done without any human oversight because a human oversight would almost in the rare cases that we've seen um, it would have guaranteed that there um, is no blocking of a profile because there was just no problem um, and this is uh, where i also unfortunately see the platforms um, in responsibility to make sure that these uh, wrongful decisions um, cannot be misused francis i saw you uh, i saw you nodding there is there is there anything you want to add to uh, to that yeah, I, I, I just want to reiterate what I said before that like I, I, I think there's a lot of situations where like um, I, like we, we talk about this with like chronological feeds where Facebook comes in and says like we can't do a chronological feed because like we've run that experiment we get shown more bad stuff and it's like well yeah but you're assuming you're not going to change other parts of the product right like in the case of, of a lot of this really bad content the problem is not that someone created the content it's that Facebook gave the most distribution the most exposure to this content to the most extreme content right and so when we talk about the idea of like is this like how expensive would it be to actually fulfill a mandate of allowing individuals to have more redress the the question is the platforms have a lot of knobs they can turn to make that cost less you know being more responsible in general is another way to get less user complaints about this content so I, I think it's I don't I don't want to give into their frame of reference and, and talk about like how expensive is it going to be to comply because they have lots of ways to bring the cost down. They just have to think more holistically. Shifting to a slightly different but yet but related uh, topic, there's also questions uh, to you, um, Emma. Um, question is actually like, what would you like the platforms to do right now today in regards, for instance, to the situation in, in Ukraine, given your experience as well in the Syrian conflict and being exposed by sort of a, a mobilization of, of troll armies that are uh, actually part of an organized effort on behalf of, of state actors um, as well, actually. Thank you for that question. Um, I think that there's a, a discussion to be had and a distinction to be drawn between um, peacetime disinformation and conflict disinformation. So what we see in peacetime, we see polarization, uh, different narratives, extreme views taking precedent, um, the precedence that that's very, that's very dangerous. And I, I understand that. And there is a response, a specific kind of response that's needed. And I think a lot of focus, a lot of emphasis has gone into looking at those specific issues and understanding them. Conflict is a different beast because you have a side in the conflict who sees information as part of total warfare. That means it is an integral mm -hmm. part of the war fighting strategy. It's not a neutral space. And I know we can talk about it, like, I think most of these information spaces are quite dirty anyway. But what we see in wartime is where you have an actor or a side or a combination of collective of actors who have a distinct outcome. And there are no rules in warfare. The rules are not imposed. Everything is justified. And that is something you have to expect. The viciousness, and the dirty tactics are kind of hard to imagine. And this is what puts us again in an asymmetric position because we as one side want to be responsible conflict actors. We see ourselves as being bound by international humanitarian law and the laws of armed conflict. The other side does not. The other side doesn't care. We know that they are targeting civilians. We're seeing them targeting humanitarians. We know what the position is. Therefore, why would we expect any fairer behavior within the information space? So what I'm seeing now, and this comes from this very brief trip that I took, again, this is it's anecdotal, but from Poland and Slovakia. What we're seeing there is populist, for the moment, we've seen a massive swing. So in, what is encouraging is we've seen a big shift between previous hostility to the EU and those types of narratives, which are pervasive among some of the opposition politicians and populist politicians in and around Central Europe, and that is a theme that is a, it's a baseline theme that remains. Now there has been in response to the, the what most people understand, the exception maybe of Serbia, um, of a Russian invasion in Ukraine, we have seen a radical shift towards support for Ukraine. And that unity is, I, it's unprecedented, this, the unity around our response to Ukraine. However, that may not last. And we're already seeing efforts to create divisions in some of those more vulnerable countries where populism has been, those populist politicians in particular, and they're, who are running for completely 
separate purposes. I'm not arguing, I'm not saying they're part of the Russian state disinformation campaign, but I'm saying they are vulnerabilities that Russia will exploit to their ends, useful idiots, if you like, or trends and, and social fissures that Russia will seek to exploit, because that's what it always does. And so what we will start to see emerging is I think, pressure on that unity. And the most divisive issue is going to be around migration and refugees. So we should look, we can look for it there. We know where they're going to strike. So we should look at any advertising, any type of paid promotion or any type of amplification of those types of narratives. And that, so in terms of what do I want the platforms to do? People may have a right to free speech, and this is again coming under pressure. I'm already seeing those arguments coming out against any kind of censorship, even in the conflict context. I would argue that you, yes, you have a right to free speech. You do not have a right to a platform. You do not right, have a right to amplification. That needs to stop. Paid promotion around anything regarding these narratives needs to stop. I understand how they, that may be difficult on the other side, because what, for example, about fundraising campaigns to support refugees, they require paid promotion. They require that type of, of platform. Well, that needs to be considered and that needs to be nuanced. But what we can see still is, for example, some of these politicians who I won't name have their own social media hubs. They have staff that they pay every month. They have budgets that they put on this. And I'm pretty sure, and I mean, from, from the, um, the statistics that were given to me based on the Slovakian analysis, you know, in a country of four and a half million, three and a half, roughly three and a half million are using Facebook. And there is no content moderation in Slovak. Okay, that's the problem. And no you know, AI either. And no AI. I mean, it's bananas. And when these groups, and that is a group, it's, it's, it's quite, I mean, it's remarkable. You have a young government there that's relatively inexperienced, working very closely with civil society, trying to improve the information environment, to try and avoid some of these very vulnerable areas of society, which could be easily fermented. And they're getting together to work together. And in their analysis, they're seeing 80% of this is, is nonsense stuff that is divisive and polarizing. Well, stop amplifying it. I don't know how the algorithms work, but just stop. You know, that's the easy solution. Or accept that further government-based regulation will have to step in because there are laws which could be applied. But even civil society doesn't want their own government to apply those laws, those sense of potential opportunities for censorship. Why? Because what happens if you get a different kind of government in the future? They know they'll be the ones who are censored. They're already looking at Navalny in, in, in Russia, Medusa. They're already looking at that information environment. And they know how easy when you have authoritarianism, how easily things can change back. So what the, the only way we can do this is by putting pressure on the platforms. It shouldn't sit with governments. It should absolutely sit with platforms. And we need to look at wartime and accept that we are currently in a state of war with an enemy that has no scruples whatsoever and will try and hurt us in every single way we, we offer it. This is not about commerce. It's not about bottom line anymore. This is about, this is an existential battle and people are already dying. That's where I'd say. Francis or Josephine, do you want to add anything to this? No, it was a great summary. Exactly, I, I agree as well. And we indeed, are, we're already seeing how sort of the war in Ukraine is shaping also the negotiations on the Digital Services Act, where, where countries or the European Commission or members of the European Parliament are indeed contemplating to potentially um, have a specific crisis protocol that you can sort of jumpstart when there is a situation like the, um, the war in Ukraine and where you can actually have sort of like a quicker pr procedure um, imposing certain new obligations on, on platforms to, to make sure that they are doing um, the right thing, actually. Um, maybe interesting also on, on that front, we have a uh, question from an actual uh, negotiator, and he put that word in, uh, in brackets, in the Digital Services Act, who is basically asking sort of all of you in the panel, like, what would you consider to be sort of the, the two or three main priorities that should be kept in the final compromise on the digital uh, the digital service act and and of course article 17 and improved user redress mechanisms are are one of these priorities but there are sort of like different um different aspects that 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 would need that would be very important to be um included actually um francis do you want to go first and then maybe josephine um i do not know currently what the the compromises that are being 
negotiated are, but I but I can say like the the I my my big you know hill to die on is around linguistic equity, because um, I believe linguistic equity um, in the context of these big tech platforms is is like an international peace issue, right? That when we don't value linguistic equity, when we allow our digital colonizers to come in and extract money from us and then leave us with all the costs we end up destabilizing some of the most fragile places in the world, right? Like the places that ha are most risk of things like ethnic conflict also are often places that speak languages that are quite small. And if we value pluralistic, linguistically, ethnically diverse societies, and I believe Europe is a light in the world for that, showing how different, pe different peoples can work together for common goals and common values. Um, we have to really care about making sure that we don't leave languages behind that we are not about only the big languages, we're about all languages and all peoples. And so that means transparency on how much moderated resources are allocated per language. How much time does it take between a, com when a complaint is filed and when it is judged, acted upon? Even if, even if all it is is send, they send you an email, like how, how much time goes by? How often are humans versus AIs used? Um, you know, what are the rates of overturned decisions? These things matter on a per language basis because like, like the example of Slovak, Slovak matters. Doesn't matter how many speakers it has. Slovakia as a country matters, Slovak as a language matters. The Slovak people matter. Because when we don't value small languages, we, give, we, we allow the colonizer to win. So um, that's my, my main, my, my standard soapbox. As a, as a Dutch native speaker, I would only uh, agree with that. Um, yep. Josephine, what are your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, of course, my focus is a bit different, uh, more to the users' rights and to the situation of people that want to be heard by the platforms. Um, and I also have to say that I um, will focus only on the current situation in the trialogues. Of course, we had much higher expectations and lowered them already um, in the progress of negotiations, um, but uh, we also see and want to be realistic um, what we are dealing with. So redress is on the on the top of our of our list uh, to solve the, the issue with Article 17 that we discussed already a lot today. The second um, issue um, that is still in question in the current trialogue um, to me is uh, to make sure that you don't do any unnecessary concessions to the platforms um, in terms of no monitoring principles and also the liability regime that we have. Um, I know that there is a political uh, will from the side of the parliament to uh, um, even, um, yeah, to make even broader the no monitoring um, obligation and to even um, prevent courts and authorities from making specific um, requests on, on certain pieces of content um, to do more research on, on some things um, that are not only um, focused on removing one piece of content, but yeah, having a broader investigation. Um, this is unnecessary. We, sh we should uh, keep the status quo um, here that uh, serves um, as well as it can. Um, and the second, uh, the, the third thing, I'm sorry, is um, that uh, we think that there should, there's no need to uh, even, yeah, make even broader the, um, the requirements for actual knowledge because platforms can only be held liable for content that they have actual knowledge of. That's the rule that we have. And also, we see that there is a will from the side of the parliament to make it impossible to have actual knowledge, even if you use the official notification form. And this is something um, that I also um, don't see a political need uh, for this, um, because um, we should yeah, make users. So if we offer the users an official notification form, then this should be and should guarantee the legal security that there is now an actual knowledge from the side of the platforms if all the requirements are met there. Um, and yeah, this is something where we really urge lawmakers uh, not to not to give in um, to this um, argument. Emma, maybe like I'm not ex expecting you to follow all the ins and outs of this highly technical European negotiating and legislative uh, process, actually. But I, in, in general, like how do you think um, empowering individual users like yourself could help tackle disinformation on on a broader scale, for instance, like what if the um, uh, some of the solutions that, that that Josephine, for instance, brought forward in terms of uh, improved user redress mechanisms, like how uh, how would have that make a change to your situation in, in 2015 or 2016, for instance? 
I mean, I think the reality, this comes back to links to the previous, to the previous discussion around how much resource and who's going to carry the cost. You know, we were prepared. We did all of the research. We compiled. We actually went through every single tweet, every single, single Facebook post that we could find and actually went and gave the evidence to the platforms and showed them and actually went into their terms and, and terms and conditions and said, here's where it violates this. Here is where this one. And actually tried to make it as easy as possible. Because the thing is, if you can create a more equitable relationship between the user and the platform, I think you'll find that the users are prepared to share their knowledge. And they're the ones who have the knowledge. Even a content moderator on Syria probably wouldn't have been good enough for about two to three years to understand this because they didn't understand the ins and outs of the conflict. Even if they knew the conflict politically, they wouldn't have understood why, for example, a specific argument was so penetrating. You know, but a user can, if given the opportunity, they will take time and they will share that knowledge. And I think that builds to a much healthier environment. It will educate people. That can. I, I saw there was a question around um, public diplomacy. I think these, this is part of an ongoing evolutionary discussion, but one in which the key issue is, is symmetry, is leveling the playing field between us and them and forcing them to listen to us, but rec in recognition that we'll give our time. You know, we're not gonna expect you to hire, uh, you know, first class White House level political experts in order to be able to assess every conflict in the world. It wouldn't be manageable. But if we give a platform for the users to be able to put forth evidence-based arguments, there is the solution. And I think, I think Josephine mentioned it. You know, it's very demoralizing when you do all that work and then you get no response or you just get ignored, or they just say, no, it still doesn't. Well, explain to me how it doesn't. Explain to me without the kind of legalese text, have a human discussion and try and argue your point. But that can only happen in a redress mechanism in a place where you have an arbiter. Otherwise it's just a discussion, right? So I think that this would have, if such a piece of legislation existed, it would be game changing. And I think it would be, far, it would be part of that evolution of creating fundamentally a much healthier information environment writ large. I think this was indeed sort of a point that was made like very eloquently now by you that also illustrates why Article 17 is indeed so important uh, within the DSA, because I think many people sort of often uh, don't pay that much attention to us, given all the other interesting things that are being discussed there in terms of like liability for platforms, access to data for researchers um, and so on. Um, and maybe a, a, a question for, uh, for Josephine um, as well. So, if, if users are not given redress in Article 17 of the DSA, for instance, to act on uh, inaction on harmful content, what other options do they actually have and how feasible is it to, um, to attain them? So basically, in a nutshell, like where does the DSA leave us without a balanced redress mechanism? Unfortunately, the DSA could not uh, decide to have some rules on, on litigation, for example. Um, I, in the beginning, I wished uh, for for having like a summary proceedings or something that makes people go to court faster, uh, making cases more reliable. But um, unfortunately, it did not happen, um, and we still see that we have a different kind of protection level uh, when we, for instance, look at at copyright, uh, where you have fast track proceedings and all the stuff that we would wish for on social media and in content moderation issues. Um, so basically, to answer your question. Um, in terms of harmful content, where mainly the terms and conditions are concerned, there are hardly any, any mechanisms that you can uh, employ. It depends on the national law a lot, since the DSA does not have a rule for it. And uh, maybe if, if you live in a country where class action is possible, there might be some options, but the terms and conditions are generally formulated very, very vague. And so um, it's really hard to pin the platforms down on them. Um, that's something that might also uh, be touched by the DSA, but I'm not really convinced that so much will change because if you look at the provisions um, that are in the DSA right now and compare them to the platform's um, terms and conditions, um, then nothing will, will change uh, too much because um, it's not about the bindingness, only about the human rights standards. And of course, they are already re very well formulated, but poorly applied. Um, and this is yeah where I... Um, where I see that the, the users are really helpless um, then and could only turn to a lawyer to really uh, try to find some fancy, expensive uh, options. And this is not going to happen. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Josephine. Um, I noticed we're almost um, almost at time. Um, so I was wondering whether um, all three of you could sort of have like one sort of final uh, final takeaway to the DSA negotiators, for instance, on, on, on this point and what they would need to um, sort of uh, take into account when um, deciding on the final formulation of the uh, of the Digital Services Act. Um, Francis, can we start with you and then maybe Emma and closing with, with Josephine? Sure. I think it's really important for us to think a little bit about how did we get here, right? Like what is the series of choices that Facebook made and what is the system of incentives that encourage those choices to be made? Reality is until the incentives change, Facebook's behavior will not change. One of the things that individual redress does is it increases the costs for distributing um, content that users find harmful. Facebook has lots and lots of options for making the distribution of those things happen less without even focusing on content. So I'll give you an example. If we require someone to click on a link before they reshare it, that alone decreases misinformation on the order of like 10%. And other platforms like Twitter have chosen to take up these non-content based interventions. But Facebook, because right now they're just optimizing for engagement, right? For um, how much content people consume on the systems, they don't require you to click on the link before you reshare it. If consumers were allowed to say, I have a right to flag for you when uh, violating content is distributed on your platforms, and I have the right for a human to look at that, that complaint within 24 hours, you're right. It would cost the platforms a lot more to continue to operate the way they do today. But we should not accept their framing of the problem. We should not accept that the only way they can operate is the way they operate today. Facebook has at least 20 options on the table that are just like that clicking on a link. You know, these are, these are not magical AIs. These are product changes. They're unwinding product choices these platforms made. So don't accept when they say, this is too expensive to do. Say, great, now you're actually accepting the costs of bad decisions. So why don't you go make better decisions? Emma, what would, what would your message be? I mean, I think in the way that Francis talks about just altering the calculation through incentives, I think that's from a user perspective, that's how I look at it as well. The incentives are stacked in favor of the other side. So for example, if I make a complaint about Vanessa Bealy and she gets blocked or her account, she gets deplatformed, which she did briefly and now is back on Twitter, um, she gets to complain, but I don't get to complain about that, right? <laughs> so there's fundamentally an asymmetry. If I don't get to against a side, and again, I, I know I've emphasized a lot about the sort of conflict perspective of this, but given I think where we are, I still think it's relevant, but particularly in the case of conflict, where you have one side that's gonna be very heavily coordinated. One thing we've seen throughout in every situation is the good guys aren't, they're just not but we don't work together, we're just normal people. And we don't have the skills, we don't have the resources, we don't have any of this to fight expensive legal battles, which is what it might take. There are only a few organizations in instances like the White Helmets who even get that kind of level of access to be able to give the briefing. It should be a standard issue. It should be basic and I completely agree. I think we'll start to see some wonderful things happen if we do this. I don't think we should, and I, and I absolutely agree with Francis. I think those companies, they can alter those calculations any day they want to. So we just have to shift that thinking. And this is an opportunity to do so and, and make the, the internet a much safer space. So that, that would be my last point. Josephine. Yes. Um... So I know that it's really important to address the systemic risks and risk mitigation issues and also the oversight, um, but to say it with the words of a campaign that we uh, started around the DSA, it's power to the users because we, we need the users um, to make uh, the internet safer and also to hold the platforms reliable and therefore the only uh, choice that we uh, can have here is to go with the council text and really enable users to use the redress mechanism which is really easy done by including very uh, few words, which is whether or not um, you could see it in the text if you want to look it up. 
um, and yeah, to make users, uh, to, to take users in a place where they can have redress and hold the platforms accountable and increase the pressure. Thank you very much, Josephine. And I think this is a very concrete recommendation to take away uh, from this conversation as well. Uh, as we all know, words matter uh, a lot. And in this context, so three specific words in a specific article of the DSA can, can uh, mean a world of, of change as well, actually. Um, I would really uh, like to thank all our speakers today and also the participants for all their uh, input. Um, and I just want to um, uh, give a, like a warm reminder that the recording of this um, event will be available um, online in the in the future as well. So th thanks a lot, everyone, and uh, have a great uh, rest of your day.